Hello? Yes. It works. Yes. Okay, uh, welcome back everybody. We're going to start uh, today's session. The first speaker is uh, Gigi Gutso, who's going to tell us about challenges in current and future large-scale structure surveys in cosmology. Okay, thank you, Martin. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I would like to thank the, the organizers to invite me to uh, try and give this uh, quick overview of uh, some of the challenges that we are facing when thinking about <coughs> using large-scale structure to, to learn about cosmology. Uh, so there are many things I won't talk about today. I will essentially concentrate on challenges related to Resch's surveys, so large-scale structure uh, as measured by Resch's surveys. And in, in this plot, I, I just made a cartoon that some of you probably have seen already, uh, in which we, we see the progress in the sampling the universe around us from low redshifts, you have slow digital sky surveys, the luminous galaxies, both, these are all pretty wide angle surveys, so covering large volumes, uh, but peering to, into moderate depth, uh, while surveys like Vipers that you see here have tried to push uh, this same concept of surveys. So in this case, is a complete survey of uh, all, all colors and all galaxies with only a simple uh, magnitude limit selection uh, down to redshift of the order of one. Uh, this is so essentially the state of the art at these redshifts, and the future is essentially Euclid and Daisy. And I will try to, uh, well, there are other things ongoing, of course, and apologize if I won't cover them. Uh, I will try to uh, concentrate on challenges that come from the general uh, task of analyzing this data and get unbiased cosmological information from these and actually also trying to understand what, we do, what do we really want to understand, what do we really want to learn from these surveys. Okay, what do, what do we want uh, to the very, at the very end is to measure uh, information, to extract information for this very simple uh, statistics that is the power spectrum, or if you prefer the correlation function. You want to uh, get the signature of a, large, a number of effects that uh, change the shape of this, of this function. And so uh, this is about the regime where uh, for coming Resch survey we'd be able to sample. This is a plot from the Planck papers. And this is where cosmic microwave background observations dominate. Uh, and you, you expect to be able to do many things with Resch and, uh, and things that have been done already but at a higher level of precision. Uh, you know, all effects that I'm, I'm not going to describe here, but uh, that change your, your, your shape and to the, very to the very minimal information, the overall shape of this function depends on things like omega, ma omega matter, the baryon fraction. Uh, you know, there are wiggles, wiggles from baryonic acoustic oscillations, and those are those that you can use as standard ruler uh, to, measure, uh, to measure distance information, and, and so cosmology, derived cosmology from them. Um, so you, the final aim is what, is what that you want to get th things like this. This is just one example of a forecast from uh, the very recent uh, uh, most updated Euclid uh, forecasts. This is from the science performance verification document uh, that is using uh, all the uh, machinery validated by this, what we call the IST, the Intra Science Working Group Task Force on Forecasting that there is a massive paper in, in, in being, in going through internal review at, the, at the, in this moment. And this, this effort was led by Valeria Petorino, Ariel Sanchez, and Tom Kitching. And the, the contribution, the hard contribution of many others uh, is really a long-term long, long -term work. But anyway, this is what you want to get uh, from the shape of the function, essentially. But, uh, and also, you want to use the anisotropy of that function uh, that is uh, uh, what uh, actually the universe allows us to measure by 
uh, distorting our maps of redshifts uh, due to the fact that galaxies move. Galaxies move because of the inhomogeneous, you know, inhomogeneous part of the universe. So from redshift surveys, you get both the background e expansion information, and you can also get information about the inhomogeneous part, so the, the growth of structure. And we know that this is uh, a very important uh, probe of uh, whether, well, some modification of gravity is a potential, dif uh, is a potential uh, origin for, for what we see and we call dark energy. Uh, although the two things are not really very distinguishable in, in, many, in many cases. Uh, so this is concerning the growth of structure. This is a kind of uh, old forecast for Euclid, but still in the, in the, absolutely in the right ballpark compared to where we stand in, in this uh, uh, growth of structure measurements. Uh, I added a recent measurement from one of the is a measurement from EBOS down here, and this is what Euclid essentially aims to achieve. So uh, the name of the game is 1% accuracy, or 1% precision, sorry, uh, on, on the measurements. And this has to, this has to, you know, this is what we have to face uh, in terms of systematics. So these are the challenges. The challenges are to be able to use the uh, ab abundance of data that, uh, that we are going to build uh, without, uh, you know, with the measuring, measuring things with the right, with the right tool, okay? Not with a biased tool. And uh, there are uh, um, essentially two areas where you get systematic errors. And uh, one is observational effects, so how well you are able to handle your data. And the other one is modeling, essentially how able you are to uh, connect your data to the theory predictions. And this is, you know, there is a long way through long way between one and, and the other, and I'll, we, I'll show you some, some, some highlights about this. I will add at the end a little, a little comment about going beyond doing spectroscopy just to measure redshift, and I will tell you what I mean at the end. Um, systematic effects are so important, and in the, in the Euclid project, we even got a, speci a specific task force that looked into that and produced this massive document, which is unfortunately not yet complete, but is extremely rich, extremely interesting, uh, led by, by Ariel Sanchez and Ben Granet, and, uh, and with the contribution of a few other people. And here there is a, a very nice description of, of, of all the possible uncertainties. So let's start with the observational effects. And uh, given this is a general review, I'm not going to talk uh, about Euclid in particular, but in general about what will happen. And so let me start with the DAISY. And uh, in observational effects, any way you, you try to get redshifts, when you build a multi-object spectrograph, your main aim is to get as many redshifts as possible in the shortest possible time. And, um, and so you build machines which, which try to, uh, to cover your, your galaxy distribution on the sky in the most uh, efficient way. Most efficient typically means uh, filling the space homogeneously. It is not quite perfect if you have clustered distribution, and so this is going to affect your, uh, your observed clustering. You know, DAISY, for example, has uh, a specific feature due to the fact that you, 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 you position your fibers, okay, uh, through a patrolling device, which covers specific uh, uh, areas, and so imposes, uh, in the end, a pattern on the sky. Well, you have, you have to work this carefully, but uh, you know, people have shown that uh, you can actually correct this uh, very well. This is an example. This is work by David Bianchi and Will Percival. And uh, what you see here is, the, is what you get if you have no weights. So these are the multiples of the, of the correlation function. And uh, that the mean and the, and the corrected one goes exactly on top of the parent of the MOX. So uh, you, you can actually do this. But this is something you have to think, well, in advance, you know, in Vipers we had the same, same problem, and actually we recently uh, applied the same, uh, the same technique to Vipers and, and got a, a little improvement in our, in our uh, accuracy of our correlation function measurements. Um, this is, you know, what you have to do if you want to achieve the beautiful predictions of this survey. This is one example of, again, from Daisy, a slide that I got from Will Percival, uh, you know, the, the, the precision expected in the measurement of neutrino total mass and, and number of neutrino species. And this is about you know, a factor of more than four times 
uh, better than, uh, uh, than Planck plus, uh, plus both BOs. Uh, so again, you need to control your systematics if you want to achieve this. Uh, going to Euclid, the situation gets complicated because you know, all the surveys, you know, DAISY for example, VIPERS, uh, in some way allows you to find a way to correct what you are missing because you know what you are missing. You know, you, you know what is your parent sample. You know you have your complete magnitude limited sample, all galaxies on the sky down to a, a given magnitude, and you know what your selection function is going to select. Okay? Um, Euclid is not quite the same. You know, Euclid, we use uh, um, what is called the slitless technique, um, which is essentially you, 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 know, you, you open your field, you put your disperser, and you get a spectrum for whatever you put in the field. Here you have a beautiful example of, uh, from an HST Grism observation. So uh, essentially this is not what originally Euclid was supposed to do. I mean, wh when the spectroscopic concept for, was, was proposed to ESA, this included some uh, devices called micromirrors, which are actually uh, devices that are used in that, in that machine, so in video projectors. And that was a way to build the slits in space without having to uh, carve material or do things that in space you cannot do. But was still found too complicated for, for space, and so a, simplest, a simpler approach, slitless, was, was chosen, which actually makes it more complicated for the analysis of, of, of whoever. So uh, no target is required, but Euclid will be really the first time that this is used on large scales. So this brings this brings challenges, a lot of challenges. A lot of effort is de devoted in the team about, uh, about solving these challenges. This is an, a simulated Euclid field. And uh, actually, what, what you see very clearly are not galaxies, are stars. And uh, the galaxies are, are just you know, the H alpha line reshifting to the infrared is just marked by these green circles. So and there, is, there are a number of effects that uh, uh, reduce the signal to noise of this, of this data and that you have to, to take into account. Uh, this is a, just a, a, a diagram on where the line visibilities will be in the redshift range uh, of Euclid. You could observe between 0.9 and 2. Um, so there is a lot of work done, done, being done to understand foregrounds and how these affect the uh, redshift measurement um, efficiency. Um, well, okay, there is a, this is wrong, this is 2005, uh, but, uh, you know, the reason why Slitless was chosen, because in some way, uh, in, around this time, I mean, this paper in particular, this review by Carl Glazebrook, uh, stressed how, you know, space was beautiful because there was no background, and you could just do Slitless, something that on the ground you, you better not do. Uh, However, <laughs> life is, is different. Uh, in also in space, you have backgrounds, and you have the zodiacal light, which it turned out to be quite, quite a nuisance. And, uh, and also something which also was realized uh, later, late, in, well, during, during the development of Euclid is that you also get scattered light from, from bright stars that are outside of your field. So some of the lights comes in, and this gives you, uh, this gives you a, a, a a background that you have to that, that modulate the signal to noise depending where you are. But so this is a full sky simulation uh, which includes these effects. Okay, this is from the end-to-end -end, uh, galaxy clustering group that uh, w is, do is doing this work. And, uh, and so the role of simulations in this game is absolutely crucial, as well as in general everywhere in the analysis of data nowadays. But here in particular, you know, we, have, we, we started doing simulations of the spectroscopic part of Euclid since the very, very, very beginning of the, of the mission because you know, we wanted first to convince ourselves that this little technique could, could actually work. Okay. And so essentially, we, you know, there, is, there is a full pipeline in this case. This is how you, you handle it. You take a cosmological simulation. You create mock samples that simulate part of your survey or a good part or a, you know, as, as, as well as you can. This brings uh, quite heavy computational problems because you know, producing a whole sky or a 15,000 square degree Euclid survey or producing many of these is actually not really, not really easy. Okay? Uh, you add all the, for, all, the, all the foregrounds, you superimpose your survey um, 
pattern, so all of the footprint of the survey on the sky, and you put, you, you put it inside the simulator. And this will give you, uh, you know, fake measurements that you analyze and you, got, you do cosmological inference and you close the circle with the cosmology that you put in in the, in the first place. So to do this, uh, there, there is a massive, a massive um, simulation uh, together with many other smaller simulations. Uh, this is called the flagship simulation that was developed in Zurich, uh, but under the supervision of these people. You know, Joachim Stadel has been the, the main guy carrying this on. Uh, okay, move on, moving on, after observational effect, uh, let me spend a few words about uh, modeling, which is the other, the other side of the problem, because we, you know, we, we, we like linear theory. We, we, we are able to do things very well in linear theory. The universe of weather is non-linear, and uh, most of the data are in the non-linear regime, so you want to be able to use this data as much as you can down to small and smaller scales. Even, even if you have Euclid, even if you have DAISY, you go to such large scales, but you will have so much signal on small scales, and also so much information buried there that you actually can extract in some way. So we, this is an area where, of course, we, uh, people uh, in, in this room are spending a lot of time. So, uh, and you have a number of ways to circumvent the big three, as Roman Scocimaro calls them. So, you know, bias, ratio space distortion, and nonlinear revolution. This is, this is what, uh, what screens you, you know, from your theory from the data, but also it's where a lot of information is included. You know, these things do not go, do not come out uh, by chance. They, they, they depend on the cosmology as well. So in some way you, you, you can use them. And you know, we use ratio space distortion, for example, to get cosmology. Uh, so you can go around this by improving your, your modeling, of course. Uh, there is an interesting uh, point in adding higher order clustering, okay? This is good for error bars, it is good for precision, uh, but then leaves you, you know, the, 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 the concern that maybe you are adding more nonlinear problems, you know, and we, I'll show something. On the other hand, they might, you, know, they, you might be affected by different systematics, and that would be, that would be good, because there would be a cross-check. Um, a very interesting point, is, I think, is, is to try and optimize your tracers. You know, we will have huge surveys, we will have many galaxies, and provided your survey has been built with sufficient information on your galaxy population, you might want to select subsamples, not just use all the data, simply because some galaxies, you know, like it nonlinear, some others uh, are quieter and uh, better descri describing your, your velocity field, for example. I'll show you some examples. Um, on top of this, you know, can change your perspective and use actually forward modeling, which, you, which I think is very, is very interesting. And, you know, Ben Granet is doing quite a bit of work with me on this, and uh, it, it's probably another an important, you know, with improvement of our computing capabilities, I think this is going to be more and more, and more important. Okay. And I try to give you a few, a few hints about this. Um, you know, this is what you want to do in the end, just uh, quoting a, a paper in which some of these ratio space distortion growth rate measurements are used to constrain GR. Um, and so to do this, you can uh, apologize for this slide. You're not supposed to read the, the formulas. It's only to show, you know, refined all your linear models means complicating your, uh, your, your, your theory in the sense, you know, you're trying to capture your, your nonlinear effects. And for example, in ratio space distortion, uh, 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 you know, after this uh, classic paper 2004 by Roman, uh, you know, many models are built around this structure, you know, an extension of the so-called dispersion model that is you know, going beyond the Kaiser linear model by adding extra term in which you include this, you know, these functions, which are functions of, are basically power spectra, cross power spectra between, between density and the, the divergence of the velocity field and, and the, the power spectrum of the velocity field. And these are things that you don't measure. You cannot measure. You have to model them. You have to get them from simulation. So one way, for example, something that we did some time ago uh, in a paper with Julien Bell is to find better uh, um, fitting functions for, this, for these quantities. And this allows you to uh, hopefully improve a, a bit your, your model. This is the case. This is the Taruya TNS model, which is uh, one of those more, most better performing. And, yet, and then, you, of course, you want to you test everything you know, on, with, with mocks. These are Viper's tests. And this shows you 
the relative error you get on uh, f sigma 8 uh, as a function of the minimum scale that you include. You see, you are pushing to extremely small scales, and this is Taruya. It's a bit disappointing that you know, the models are not really behaving so differently. Okay? Even, even just the dispersion model, they would say, well, it's missing some pieces. Uh, still, uh, well, yes, of course, you know, Taruya here is, is going below 3%. And this is quite good. But, but here you have this jump. So you always feel a little bit uncomfortable. So yes, I, I will speed up because it's only five minutes. Uh, it's interesting what happens if you add three point information. So higher order information. This is a work, something from work which, which is doing, uh, being done by, by Cristiano Porciani and his group. Uh, in particular, this is Victoria Jankelevich uh, work where you actually get a very, very significant improvement of the figure of merit when you add the bispectrum to the power spectrum uh, in, in, in to measure W0, WA. Uh, the question is, uh, what about systematics? Because if you add the higher order clustering, you know, you have a higher order. If you start from Gaussian conditions, you have higher order clustering because you have no linear evolution. So uh, I think the, the systematic part of this still needs to be looked a bit into detail, more into detail. However, for example, if you use voids, uh, which some have become more and more fashionable and interesting, uh, this, those, you know, those include higher order information and might be a way to, to uh, get different systematics and look at things in a different way. Okay, the other point is you, know, you could try to improve your tracer. So if you have a survey that gives you all this information uh, about colors of galaxies and other properties, you can look at, uh, well, you can try multi tracers approach, which will is a way, hopefully, to, to improve uh, error bars. But most importantly, you can you know, understand astrophysics and uh, understand that galaxies behave differently com depending on some of their properties. Like you know, different galaxies uh, trace different in the velocity field. Uh, and actually, and so this means that some subclasses of galaxies might be easier to model, might require less parameters, might give you smaller error bars, might give you smaller uh, systematic errors. Uh, and this is, for example, the case where you use blue galaxies and red galaxies, uh, and, and you see this is the two-point correlation function in ratio space. Uh, this, what you see on small scales is the essential the nonlinear effect, so the high velocity dispersion uh, component in galaxy clusters and groups. You, you see for the red galaxies, it's very conspicu conspicuous because they live in high-density high, in high regions. You know, the blue part is more uh, dominated by the overall uh, infall pattern. Uh, and so uh, there is something that you might, uh, it might be easier to model, and this is indeed the case. So with Vipers, we used all these different things and put them you know, there in here, which gives us different angles and different, hopefully different systematic errors. Let me speed up uh, forward modeling very quickly. Uh, you try to model everything. Uh, in a, in a self-consistent way. You have galaxy counts of galaxies, uh, so you have to give prescriptions for the bias um, and to get, to get this consistent with the, with the density field underneath, and you cycle on, over different realizations of the density field varying the power spectrum, varying the galaxy uh, connection to the, to the density, so the bias, and in the end you find the best posterior distribution for all your quantities, including galaxy quantities like the luminosity function, for example. Um, not in, a su not in such a, 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 an extensive way, just because of computational effects, uh, is this kind of approach uh, that is you know, using uh, in body simulations, but here, unfortunately, only two in body simulations because you, cannot do, you don't have the power to do more, to do actually comparison of uh, of different gravity models, you know, rather than, again, going and measure your growth rate of structure from the data and then fit your models and, and try to get uh, constraints, you, here you go the other way around. You say, I take an embody simulation. I, I assume, well, I try to do my best to create galaxies in the embody simulation. And uh, so attach my galaxies to the halos. At that point, I can compare my theory to the data everywhere, you know, including the nonlinear regime, where, which is actually where mo you know, modification of gravity are very, uh, which is very sensitive to modification of gravity. Okay? So this is what uh, 
uh, Jinua did in this paper, which actually, uh, which shows that uh, uh, it's very hard when you modify GR very little. This is only is an f of r model with, with very small f parameter uh, <coughs> to see here. Uh, immediately, your uh, multiples in, uh, in Rashi space are affected, and, and, and you, you cannot match, match the data. You know, the, the interesting, the most astonishing thing is that you fit, you know, Lambda CDM fits the data without any, any uh, ad hoc assumption, which I found quite amusing. Um, this is my final uh, point, and I say, well, what I meant by going beyond spectroscopy, I suppose that by 2030, our wonderful data will show you just that, you know, the universe is general relativity with lambda, okay? And we don't understand what it is. Uh, we, we haven't found a dark matter candidate, so what, what should we do then? Well, uh, I, think, I think we should go back to the basics and say, you know, get more data, okay? And uh, so study galaxy and structure formation in situ. So go above ratio four, you know, we, we can do it, you know, there will be 40 meters telescope and so, and, and, and because we, we need to find the crux in the theory, you know, there is something we don't understand. So probably this is, I mean, this is just a message, um, it's something we looked at in this report uh, in a group led by Richard Ellis, um, essentially studying the case for a large aperture spectroscopic telescope for ESO dedicated to spectroscopic surveys. I think I will leave you with this. I want to leave you with a positive note, though. They said that perhaps a varying equation of state for dark energy is be just behind the corner. Uh, I just wanted to point out this recent paper using distant QSOs to, as standard candles, which, uh, you know, despite any attempt of the authors, which are very reliable people, uh, to find the systematics, tends to show a deviation from a simple lambda model. It goes in a very strange region, I understand, but, uh, and probably there is something, uh, something strange, but you know, just to say, you know, perhaps we, you know, we, perhaps we will find something with, with Euclid and Daisy. So thank you very much indeed. Okay, we have time for a couple of questions. Diagram where you show your, the test with various of RSD models, including Tauri et al., down to very small scales. And to that small scale, I wonder what, what kind of bias model do you use? Uh, are you confident about oh, yeah. the bias? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we made both, uh, we, bo we tried both a, a scale dependent bias and, uh, and the constant bias. I think in the end, you know, uh, again, if you use a s Sensible tracers, you can, you can do more simplifying assumptions. Uh, if you use red galaxies, it's certainly you have to use a, a, a scale-dependent bias. But that adds an, another parameter, and, uh, and so the error bars become larger. Uh. So the De La Torre et al. paper uses a, uses a scale-dependent bias, uh, uh, while the Petzot et al., I think, used the, the, fixed, the fixed bias, cost of bias. Yeah, a question about what you said in the beginning and the effort you made uh, in terms of understanding systematics. So it was mainly focused on two-point correlation functions or power spectra. On the same time, you were saying that to exploit the full capabilities of, of Euclid-like observation, you need to go beyond power spectra. So how do you cross the two problems? Yes, well, I, I, this is uh, actually I mentioned very quickly at some point that uh, you know, it, it, it clearly adds a lot of information, and so you, the error bars become smaller. Uh, on the other hand, you know, if you use uh, higher order information, you are really using nonlinear clustering. And so once more, you know, your accuracy of modeling and all these things become crucial. Uh, I don't think the, but I'm not sure, I mean, but I don't think the, the work of Cristiano already has such an exploration of the, of the systematic effects, you know. It shows that you get a lot, you, you gain in, the, in terms of figure of merit. Yeah, in terms of, of statistical, statistical power, yes, but in terms of systematics, this is not explored, right? No, no, that's, that's, that's my understanding of them, but I think yes, and that's, we, we need to do that, yeah. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Okay, okay.
Can you hear me? Does it work? Uh, it's probably muted. Okay, it's okay. Good. This is uh, this is the common. Um, okay. Shall I? Um, does the mic work? Can you? Okay. So. Um, Thank you for inviting me, and um, I will try to talk a little bit more about the higher orders that were mentioned in uh, Gigi's talk. I want to start with a few motivational um, slides. Um, so basically, we have this wonderful standard model of cosmology. It has only six parameters. Um, it fits very well all the data that we have available so far, uh, and there are some nagging discrepancies. Um, if you look at the uh, sigma rate from um, uh, high redshifts and low redshifts, they seem to you know, systematically differ. And if, when you measure H naught, uh, the Hubble um, constant from, again, from high redshifts and low redshifts, there is, uh, you know, this famous offset. Um, and the good thing is that, um, oh, sorry, and, um, you know, uh, an important contribution to this, um, you know, standard model of cosmology and tight error bars is the, uh, large-scale structure analysis. Um, this is something that Gigi covered in his talk. And you know, one thing that I want to highlight is that uh, all of the standard, uh, the standard LSS analysis that we advertise, our flagship measurements that we put in our MCMC chains, uh, comes from the analysis of two-point functions on linear and semi-linear scales. So it's um, these uh, BAOs, which are intrinsically uh, large-scale features, and uh, um, Redshift space distortions on scales of 30 megaparsecs and, and above. And that's good. They are considered to be very robust and systematics free. You know, PAO is very robust. Redshift space distortions, there are some questions, but we believe we can make them work. And so in um, about 10 years, this picture will change. We will have lots of PAO measurements, lots of redshift space distortion measurements. Um, I took this uh, picture from the WFS report where the big ellipse shows current figure of merit and the small ellipses show projected figures of merit. So, I mean, the basic idea is that these error bars will shrink. They will shrink, but unfortunately there is cosmic variance. We have only finite volume, so the number of linear modes is finite and we will very likely saturate that cosmic variance limit at lower redshifts where dark energy is important. Um, and so, uh, if we discover something new convincingly that would be great but if we are still close to this lambda and if we still have this nagging three sigma four sigma um, discrepancies that would be really annoying and uh, so if we are in that situation we cannot do any more BAOs we have to think of um, something else so how do we how do we sh further shrink these uh, these ellipses I know there are many generic options currently we're doing linear two point um, so one option is to make this linear two-point better, maybe do a better reconstruction, do some sort of, um, you know, smart weighting. Uh, you know, this is good, this is safe, but again, this is limited. You, can, uh, you cannot really break the uh, cosmic variance um, per year. Uh, so you can also give up, uh, you can move to completely new probes, look at velocity fields, topological measures of large-scale structure, look at the voids. Uh, and uh, I, when I looked at the Cosmo Gold uh, program, there are, you know, I, I think there are talks uh, covering all of this, so I'm really looking forward to learning more about these options. Um, but if you want to stay kind of closer to the, uh, to the baseline, there are two things that you can do. One thing is that you can, you know, give up on linear. You can move to smaller scales, probably uh, with computer-assisted uh, modeling. Uh, and you can also give up on the two-point and move up in the hierarchy and uh, do linear three-point statistics. So in my talk, I will you know, talk exclusively about this, about this uh, final option, linear three-point, which Gigi mentioned isn't really linear, but you know, the leading, uh, you know, large scales. So you know, just to remind you really fast uh, what this is all about, uh, two-point gives you probability of pairs, three-point gives you probability of triplets. This is in configuration space. In Fourier space, your power spectrum is a, a correlation between two modes, and your bi-spectrum is a correlation of three different modes. 
and the spy spectrum is in the end uh, a 5D function of um, cosmological parameters. You have three lengths and you have two angles. Um, so um, you always have bi spectrum. Um, you start with Gaussian initial conditions. Perhaps there is a small amount of non Gaussianity, but then there is nonlinear gravitational evolution. Then there is galaxy bias, which is also nonlinear. So um, you know, there is always a bi spectrum at lower redshifts. And you know, from this picture, from this origin story, it's immediately obvious that you can use bi spectrum to extract things like FNL, um, B1 and B2, the bias parameters. And uh, you know even growth rate and omega m because um, the nonlinear gravitational evolution depends on those. And those are you know wonderful things to do. In my talk, you know that's not really what I will concentrate on. What I want to do, my ambition is to measure this bias spectrum, um, use it as a new standard ruler, look how how it is being stretched by alcock pachinski effects, how it's being made anisotropic by richest space distortions, and measure distance scale, the angular distance and age, and measure the growth um, kind of in a similar way that we do from, uh, from the power spectrum. So I'm not saying it's easy, but you know, that's the ambition, you know, five-year plan. Um, so the bias spectrum, I mean, it's, it's, I think, fair to say that it has been uh, underused um, so far, and it's understandable because two-point is easier. And it kind of gives you a lot. And you know, a few reasons you know, not to, to be reluctant to do bi spectrum is, is that it's difficult to compute, it's difficult to model. Uh, you, know, you don't gain as much, gains seem to be incremental. And uh, you know, there is also this idea that you can get this information by reconstruction anyway. And so um, um, uh, I would like to argue in my talk that you know, most of these points are not really true anymore, or maybe were never true. It, uh, we've made significant advancements. We have new algorithms, fast computers. So you know, there is no difficulty to compute bi spectrum. My postdoc can compute thousands of bi spectra overnight on his desktop computer. Uh, I will also argue that it's not true that you don't gain. You gain only a little bit on top of the two point. Uh, and I will also argue that it's not the case that you can get this information with the reconstruction. The only point that I'm uh, willing to concede is that it's, it's really difficult to model. That's, that is true. Uh, more difficult than the two point. Um, um, so uh, uh, my, my next slide is, um, it, it's my observation that is the most controversial slide. Usually when I present these things, people, you know, that's when people start to make faces and, uh, you know, shake hands, heads, and, you know, they, they tell me that I'm wrong and I miss the factor of two pi. But I will make this uh, point anyway, and if you disagree with me, you know, please let me know. Um, and um, you know, I would be happy to be proven wrong. But the statement that I will make is that uh, it's not the case that the information content of the power spectrum of the reconstructed field is the same as the information content of the power spectrum of the original nonlinear field before reconstruction plus all the higher orders. Um, so historically, my success when I talk to my senior colleagues like yourself in convincing them that this is the case is one in five. I don't know. you know. I may be preaching to the choir, so I don't know how you feel about this, but uh, you know, please let me know later. Um, and when I say that it's not the case, I don't mean practicalities. It's not that you know you cannot do perfect reconstruction because you know there is shell crossing. You know, I don't care about that. Uh, but if, even if you did a reconstruction perfectly and if you modeled the uh, higher orders perfectly, I don't think this is true. Um, this is accidentally true for currently available data sets. For example, for both, this happens to be true. I think this is true for the CMB, although I'm not a CMB scientist, so you know, I don't understand data analysis as well. And I think, and this is also true if you measure amplitude-like parameters, like A sub S, or not F sigma rate. Sorry, this should be a sigma rate. This should be a sigma rate, not F sigma rate. OK, so let me move on. Um, you know, just one more slide on this. So, so what reconstruction does is reconstruction makes your gear sharper. Um, so for the unreconstructed field, you have your power spectrum with some PEO and you have a bi spectrum. Both of them you can stretch and use as a standard ruler if you can model them well as a function of scale. What reconstruction does is it, it makes your, um, it removes the bi spectrum and it makes your uh, BAO peaks sharper. And this is good, uh, but you know, there is, I don't, I was unable to find any mathematical reason why for an arbitrary random field, you know, this gain would be exactly equal to you know, whatever you get by getting this extra five-dimensional standard ruler. 
Okay, so enough about this. Um, now, I, uh, you know, before you do something, you would like to um, know, you know, what you will get in the best case scenario if you are successful. Hence, uh, cosmological forecasts. You know, just to remind you, uh, you know, very few basic facts about pi spectrum and how it works. This signal shot noise scales as one over n squared. Um, and the number of uh, triangles, number of valid triangles, scales as k to power 6. And so um, you really get a lot out of bi spectrum if you have a dense sample. When you increase number density, uh, you, know, you gain more than you do in the power spectrum. And also, uh, you gain more if you move to nonlinear scales. Like the difference between k max of 0.15 and k max of 0.2 for the bi spectrum. I think is a factor of 0.5 invariance. So it's you know you will double your error, uh, error you will half your error, error bars if you go from 0.15 to 0.20. Um, and so the uh, uh, the forecast that I present they were based on um, uh, paper with Prafil Gagrani. These are simple Fisher constraints. They are you know not very realistic in terms of systematic uh, systematics and observational um, stuff. But we weren't trying to make uh, uh, precise uh, predictions for specific surveys. We were trying to make more general points, and I think for, you know, for that purpose, I think it serves well, sufficiently well. So what I'm showing here is this is um, expected uh, error bar on sigma, uh, expected error uh, inverse error bar on, on the growth rate that you would get from DESI uh, if you to, you measured your bi spectrum and went up to a, a max of 0.2 and analyzed all nodes, and you had no systematics. And it's normalized with respect to the same thing that you would measure from the power spectrum. So this black line is what you get from the power spectrum. The uh, squares and the circles are what you will get for the uh, bi spectrum. And I guess the main point here is that for the bright galaxy sample, which is a really, really dense sample, and that's where bi spectrum does well, you get this factor of three. So the claim here is that if you measured if you did the standard redshift basis ocean analysis on BGS um, galaxies, and if you manage to model everything up to 0.2, you, your error bars on uh, the growth rate would improve by a factor of three. Um, and you know, then there is this uh, main sample which has uh, lower density, so it doesn't do as well. But you know, it's still, I mean, you're doing slightly better than the uh, power spectrum. And then this tail is simply the number density that drops, and the you know, shot noise makes a uh, bispectrum not, so, uh, not so useful. Um, right. Um, and so this is kind of a motivational s figure. You know, it doesn't, I don't really believe that BGS is low redshift, and I don't really, you know, it would be hard to model all the bispectrum uh, in redshift space up to 0.2. But you know, it's nice to know that there is a factor of 3 in there somewhere, at least theoretically, even in, in the future. You know, so maybe we cannot get to that, but you know, if you go halfway still, it's a big improvement. A factor of three is a factor of nine in volume, or the square root of three, a factor of nine in volume. So you know, that's 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 pretty decent. Uh, you know, this, you see the same thing when you look at the BAOs. So the idea is, here is that you take the bi spectrum and you start stretching it and aligning BAO peaks. And again, you know, it's it's not doesn't work as well for the BAO, but still. Uh, where you have um, um, high number densities, you, you, you do well. This is, again, normalized to the power spectrum. You get factors of 1.5. And you, know, you see these things with, for all surveys, but they are most uh, pronounced in surveys that look at dense samples like VGS. You know, double first is, is good. Um, probes like Atlas are good because they also have high number density. Uh, and so if these plots kind of look suspicious to you, it's probably because you've seen um, you know, figures like this that show you signal to noise of the Gaussian and the uh, power spectrum and the bi spectrum. And you know, it kind of looks from here that the bi spectrum is incremental. And that's mainly because um, you know, there is no such thing as signal to noise, really. When people say signal to noise, they usually mean signal to noise on individual Bi spectrum power spectrum measurements in beans, that's the signal to noise of the amplitude. And you know, it, it is true that if you were measuring the amplitude, bi spectrum would only be incremental, but uh, you know, there are different kinds of signals to noises. For redshift distortions, it seems to be working much better. 
OK, so what I want to do now is I want to kind of talk a little bit about recent works in this direction, large scale uh, bispectrum three point analysis. And uh, this is a very incomplete list of recent works. It's biased towards recent. It's biased towards large scales. It's also biased towards POS, you know, because that's my bubble. That's you know, what I know. Um, and uh, I wanted to mention you know, two series of works. One was uh, led by Zach Slepian. And this is um, uh, where they used um, the three point, the real space configuration space three point to measure the BAO. And it worked reasonably well. There was a four sigma BAO detection and 1.7% measurement of the uh, scale itself. When combined with the, with the two point function, it, I think it cut the error bus by 30%. And there were other series of papers led by Hector Gilmarin uh, where um, uh, he used bispectrum monopole in conjunction with the power spectrum. Uh, and uh, you know, this helped him uh, then because he, with the bispectrum we are able to, amongst other things, break the degeneracy between growth and sig sigma rate. So we don't have F sigma rate, you have F and sigma rate separately. Um, now I want to walk, uh, talk a little bit more in detail about um, the work. It, it was a later work, not part of the BOSS uh, um, analysis uh, uh, done by David Pearson, who is a postdoc at Kansas State. And so in this work, what we tried to do is we tried to, uh, I mean, it's very difficult to do the full uh, bispectrum analysis, so we try to confine ourselves to, mono, to bispectrum monopole and to only measure the BAO. So forget about redshift space distortion. So both, you have 800,000 galaxies, this redshift range, a reasonable number density. Um, you know, if it was higher, it would be better. And we had about 2,000 Apache mocks to you know, test various things and get our um, covariance matrices. So this is the bispectrum measurement. Uh, bispectrum, in this case, is a 3D function, so there is no good way of plotting it. This is just a sequence of measurements in some arbitrary order. And this is uh, a power spectrum uh, for comparison from the BOSS. The BAO uh, feature is clearer here and not so clear here. Um, so the modeling that we did was pretty simplistic. One of the uh, you know, things that we tried to do was to see how much you can push the modeling and still get reasonable uh, results. Um, uh, the uh, scales are um, kind of linear. Um, they go up to 0.16. Uh, we used the leading order PT expression for the bispectrum, but there were some nonlinear features. The fingers of God were added in, the damping of the BAO was added in. And uh, you know, then what we do is we measure two BAO parameters along the line of sight and across the line of sight. Um, uh, this is the covariance. Covariance was the, uh, the most uh, tricky part because we had 700 measurements overall. There are lots of bispectrum triangles. Uh, we had 2,000 mocks. I mean, this is um, doable. This is a well-defined problem, but you have to account for this, um, and you need to inflate your variance. Uh, you know, we had to inflate our variance by a factor of 1.5. I think this was the leading, um, uh, you know, kind of term in the um, statistical error budget. Uh, and so this is how what we got out. Uh, these are some um, BAO chains. You have two line of sight and perpendicular of the line of sight parameters. Uh, these dashed lines are um, uh, what we call in our business alpha Vs. It's a certain combination average of the two. Um, and it wasn't, at least to me, it wasn't very obvious which way the principal component of this would lie. But turns out it in this, lies in the same direction as the power spectrum. So we're, you are basically constraining dA squared divided by H. Um, so and these are the constraints on that principal parameter. On these plots, on the left, you have the mocks. On the right, you have the data. Uh, green is the bispectrum. And you can see how green is wider, obviously, than the red. But you know, it's not. Uh, it's comparable. And so we were able to get uh, a BA constraint uh, of 2.7 and a BA detection of 4.1 sigma. I think I'm running out of time. Um, so I will uh, just jump to my. Um, uh, yeah, I will quickly show you this slide. Uh, I, I will probably jump through this side, slide. And I will move to the summary. And so my summary is that um, I'm kind of recently uh, become excited about the three-point function. And, 
I mean, my main motivation is that there seems to be more information than you would, uh, you know, naively think, expect, at least for some samples that we will get in the future. And also, you know, the standard PAO is kind of becoming boring. I mean, you know, there is a lot of work to do, sub percent level systematics, but 75% uh, of my personal work is this boring stuff, but, you know, it's, it's nice to do something, something exciting. And um, I guess the key point for me is that it, it seems to me that this problem is solvable in the end. So if, if, you, if perturbation theory doesn't work, if modeling doesn't work, if you have to resort to, to end-body simulations, I don't know, I personally feel like I would be more comfortable with end-body simulating large-scale three-point statistics rather than you know, small-scale physics. So that's all. Thank you very much. We have time for a few questions. So I hated that you put that slide of, you know, usually people start shaking their heads because I started thinking about that and <laughs> couldn't think. I mean, it's a very interesting question. Um, no, I, I like that slide, sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, I just wanted to uh, ask you whether you can say more about that. Doesn't that depend really on the on what kind of information you're looking it, for? It, it, I mean, I can totally see, you know, if you're interested in some cosmological parameters, probably, you know, all the information is in the reconstructed. But, you know, if you're interested in stuff that, you know, I don't know, how gravity changes your non-linearities, you know, in those regimes, then you need that information. I mean, you don't want to... Right, right, right. Yeah, so... Get yeah, I, I guess so I, I guess exactly it depends on what you are asking and what are... Yes, yes, and I guess that's the... Uh, so when people talk about signal-to-noise, generically, they usually mean amplitude. And for amplitude, it is true. However, you know, the most important things that we do in um, LSS analysis are not amplitude, it's... So BAO is the derivative of the amplitude with respect to the scale. And the redshift space distortion is the ratio of two amplitudes in different directions. And for those things, uh, you know, it's not the case that the bispectrum information is incremental, unless I'm wrong. Uh, uh, so I'm willing to concede that. But um, I, I just, I guess, what I'm trying to say is that there is. I, I don't think there is a mathematical theorem that tells you that for a random field, for a Gaussian random field that evolves in time. It's always true that the field, information in the field is equal to the information in all the cumulants. That's always true. But I don't think it's true unless there's something you know, really special about gravitational evolution that the evolved field is uh, you know, information equivalent to the original field. And I think if we, the, the reconstruction works this well. I mean, there is more physics just right, happening, right, right. right? I mean, you want physics to work yeah. and, and see what, what it does, right? Right. So. I mean, reconstruction works well uh, because we have a sharp feature in the power spectrum uh, in the correlation function. If we didn't have a sharp feature, so I'm not sure that the gains would be as big. Another question? So naively, um, when you do the reconstruction, uh, taking things to initial condition, we would expect the field to become uh, more Gaussian, and thereby, what's the point of doing the three-point statistics? Right, uh, and the point is, is that, you know, that Gaussian field isn't, um, so the motion of, uh, so that Gaussian field doesn't have the same amount of information as the initial non-Gaussian field that you reconstructed. So that's kind of what I'm trying to contest. So you're saying like the reconstructed field is still not fully Gaussian? Uh, no, no, it is Gaussian, but that Gaussian field isn't equivalent to the, that the, to the pro, you know, evolved field in terms of information content. So I just contest the, you know, uh, when you move things, information doesn't conserve, you know, some information. Okay, that sounds like a good discussion over coffee, right? Yeah. Let's thank the speaker again.
this one? Yes. It's already working. Yes. Now? Yes. Okay, the final talk before uh, coffee is uh, Stefan Agot Somme talking about uh, what use are baryon acoustic oscillations. Good morning, everybody. <coughs> So it's a pleasure to be here to talk about my work. So today I will try to answer these questions. So what are the uh, use of the barium acoustic oscillation and why the inner points on the ruler? And <coughs> this work is done in collaboration with Stefano Garsaniti, Ari Sanchez, Ravi Shet, Glenn Starkman, and Edith Zahavi. <coughs> okay, so that's the outline. So one of the main goals that we want to achieve in cosmology is to constrain cosmological models from cosmological probes. And to do this, we usually combine different cosmological observations. In this way, we can break the genesis among parameters. So in this context, what do we want from the barium acoustic oscillations? We want what we call the purely geometric BAO, or TARDEM. <coughs> so using this purely geometric BAO, we can uh, get accurate distance measurement that are cosmology independent. I will tell you what that means. So <coughs> to do this, we found two, two ways. The first is the linear point standard ruler, and the second is the correlation function model fit. <coughs> so what are the BAO weekly? <coughs> so initial fluctuation in gravitational potential, uh, they are measured as temperature fluctuation in the CMB by the Planck satellite, very precise measurement. Uh, this shows up as barium acoustic oscillation in the galaxy correlation function at late times, and they give us the acoustic uh, the acoustic feature. Um, so what is, the, what is interesting is that the barium acoustic oscillation gives us what we call a standard ruler. Uh, that is, this means that we have a preferred scale uh, at early times, at late times, and this scale is the commoving uh, length that has been traveled by an acoustic wave since the beginning of time, and we call this the sound horizon scale. And this corresponds roughly to the position, to the peak position in the galaxy correlation function that we measure at late times. And what is interesting is that RD, the sound horizon, is a geometrical quantity, so it's independent on the primordial fluctuation parameters. <coughs> so we can build in this way the ruler. And um, so then we want, to, we want to stress, but you know this better than me, why BAO are important for cosmology. These are one of the most constraining late time observable. <coughs> So for instance, here I show two examples. I will not uh, discuss about them, but quickly. So here they, they combine CMB, BAO, supernova, and cross micronometers to do a dark energy, to do, to do a study of the equation state for dark energy um, in a model independent way using a model independent reconstruction technique. Uh, so here what they do is they use, they found a way to use BAO to do model selection. So they, they create fake uh, KWCDM data, data, they analyze them as um, WCDM with the wrong model. So here they show that if you consider APDV that are just combination of the Hubble parameter and the angular diameter distance, you can use the BAO alone to do model selection as you see this strong tension in the parameter space. <coughs> Okay, so is, if this is the goal, what do we want from the barium acoustic oscillation? So we want to measure cosmological distances that are estimated under the following theoretical condition. We want a measurement that is geometrical, so it's independent on the primordial fluctuation parameters. We want a measure that is independent on the dark energy model, so we don't want to assume lambda CDM or quintessence. And we want a measurement that is independent on the spatial curvature. <coughs> and uh, uh, also is independent on the tracer that we are targeting with our servers. And we call this the purely geometric BAO. <coughs> so in practice, what we do, so in practice, we want to work in commoving coordinates, but since we measure angles and redshift, uh, we have to assume a fiducial cosmology and work in uh, commoving fiducial coordinates. And because of this, we are affected by the uh, Anko-Pacisky effect. That this means that a sphere in the right cosmology will look like an ellipsoid in the wrong cosmology. 
Okay, so this uh, distortion can be computed precisely for the two-point correlation function monopole in Rashi space, and this is the this is the data. This is the distorted correlation function related to the true correlation function by this alpha parameter, where alpha is called the isotropic shift, and this defined in terms of dv. That is just uh, a definition is a function of angular diameter distance and, and age. <coughs> okay. So we want to measure alpha, to measure distances, to measure dv in a more independent way. And so we have to be careful when we use this equation. On the left-hand side, the Alcopacisca equation. On the left-hand side, we have data. On the right-hand side, we have theory. And we should be careful not to introduce some wanted dependencies <coughs> in, this, um, in this game. So what complicates the games is the, uh, are the two the correlation function nonlinearities in the BO regime. Uh, so we have effects such as linear gravity, as you say, distortion, scale-dependent bias, that distort the BO feature in the, uh, yes, in the BO range of scales. So there's a relevant effect that should be taken into account. And <coughs> so here I show what I call the minimal model for the correlation function. It is the basic model that takes into account the dominant effect of nonlinearities, and this is used for BO analysis. And um, so it's simple. And we can uh, quickly analyze the cosmology dependence of, of the template. Uh, so P linear, the only relevance dependence is the energy densities and NS. A depend on lambda CDM. Uh, so, sorry, A is k independent but time dependent for uh, these models. Lambda CDM, smooth quintessence, clustering quintessence. And we don't have to assume uh, flatness. So for flatten and flatter geometries. Uh, sigma naught, the dumping parameter depend on the growth, on the dark energy model, on the curvature, and on the tracer. OK, so we should keep this in mind and go to the next led, uh, slide. So here, uh, I show what is the uh, BA only fit, that is the official standard BAO, um, um, that, that gives us the official standard BAO result. So here, basically, the minimal model is, is employed. And another broadband term, this polynomial, is, is added. And uh, so we are fixing the cosmological parameters and the dumping parameters. And this broadband term uh, with these parameters is varied over also B, this, this B, the, basically the bias, the amplitude. And what we are after is alpha, that gives us the cosmological information. So uh, the assumption here is that this broadband term takes into account a modern linear effect, and also the fact that we are fixing the cosmological parameters. And for this uh, reason, because of the cosmological parameter fixing, uh, we need to rescale alpha with this prescription, where Rd is the sound horizon, F is fiducial, at the fiducial value, and Rd is the true sound horizon. So because of this uh, prescription, we can ask if the error bus on alpha are properly estimated. And after uh, a lot of thinking, we understood how we can do this fit without fixing the cosmological parameters. So that's the Alcopacisca equation. And now we have that all the relevant parameters are, are varied over. And in this way, we can properly estimate dv. Uh, but that's uh, it's a problem because, I mean, we, can, we, we measure dv with an error that is roughly 100% or the 100%. Uh, but then we realize that uh, if we, from these parameters, we compute a secondary parameter rd, then Rd and Dv, they, are, they have similar error, and they are very highly uh, correlated. So the ratio of Rd over Dv is, is very well constrained. So now we can uh, compare uh, the error propagation, the, sorry, the errors, uh, for the correlation function model fitting and the BA only. And what we get is that I use a, a Fisher matrix uh, approach as a first step. And what we got is that the error bus of the we are only are underestimated by nearly a factor of two. So it's good that we understand how to do this um, properly. But still, there is a question, how do we really, do we really know the galaxy to point correlation function model? Um, I will come back to this question later. <coughs> but before, I want to show you a complementary approach. So this approach probably dates back to Peebles in the 70s. Um, and the idea is that the observed correlation function is related to the matter correlation function of redshift zero uh, through a, a this factor that is scale independent 
for lambda CDM, smooth quintessence, clustering quintessence, and we don't have to assume flatness. So the point is that if we measure a per fair scale in the correlation function, this will be time and model independent. So we can measure dv in a model independent way. <coughs> okay, so the idea, the idea is, is old, and people wanted to apply this, actually they apply this to, to the peak position 15, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, but then it was discovered that the peak uh, is, uh, is squashed and shifted by the linear effect as a linear <coughs> gravity redshift pay distortion and scale dependent bias. So we cannot naively use this as a, as a standard ruler, uh, as a simple standard ruler. Uh, so for this reason, we have been looking in the B range of scales, and we found a new standard ruler that we call the linear point. And what, what that is, so if you take a closer look to the correlation function, there is the usual peak, but also there is a dip at smaller scales, and there is a uh, linear point that is nothing but <coughs> the midpoint between the peak and the dip. So it has interesting feature, it's a geometrical point, uh, it's relatively independent at 0.5% level, so it's linear, and this is because it's weakly sensitive to nonlinear gravity, as it's distortion, scale-dependent bias. So exploiting these um, features, so we can perform model independent distance measurement. Uh, so how that, how that works? Um, okay, so from the nonlinear correlation function for the observed correlation function from the MOX, we can measure this quantity and apply a simple redshift independent correction of 0.5%. And this way, you are able to, um, to be accurate at 0.5% level. And what is interesting is that exploiting this feature, we can do um, from the data, when we apply this to the data, we can be independent on the correlation function model or template. So how does it work? On the left-hand side, we have data. And here, we use a model independent parametric fix to extract this quantity, this, this one. And on the right-hand side, uh, we can use linear physics, like a Boltzmann code that we know um, much better than you know, linear <coughs> nonlinearities. So that's uh, how the game works. And we apply this to the BOSS uh, galaxy samples, the low Z and C mass ones. And we estimate the linear point from the two samples. And we compare this with the uh, BNL <coughs> BOSS distances. And what we found on the pre reconstruction data, what we found is that we have a uh, consistent result with slightly smaller error bars. That's, uh, that's interesting and be convenient. So then we did a theoretical investigation where we uh, wanted to check, uh, compare the inner point errors to the correlation function model fitting where all the parameters are, are varied over. And so what we found is that the inner point is always um, more constraining than the correlation function model fitting. And so here we have two different rulers, as you see. So it's also important to stress that from um, CMB, for instance, or, I mean, we can do also theoretical analysis with CAM, we get the same percentile error from, for the two rulers. But again, there's this question. Do we know the correlation function theoretical model? What do we know about it? Uh, so <coughs> to answer this, I, I would try to answer the question of the title, why the linear point? So when we use a correlation function template, we should keep in mind that we don't really know, or if you want, there is no agreement in, in literature, or how to model linear gravity, as you say, distortion, halo bias, galaxies and halos, uh, which model to use, and what is the range of scales when <coughs> this theory works. So the standard way to deal with the data is to validate the correlation function models as uh, estimators, like to, for instance, to decide on which range of scales to fit. And so the main rule, the main rule that is followed is to avoid parameter bias. What, what about the error estimation? So the linear point is um, complementary and then different uh, feature. It's a new um, observable. And because of this feature, we can do a model independent, we can use a model independent estimator. We get maybe by chance smaller statistical errors. We are affected by embodied systematics and by zero, the 0 0.5 uh, intrinsic bias. <coughs> so a common problem for everyone is that we do have a initial simulation for dark matter at an early convergent, but what about galaxies? We don't have a initial simulation for, for galaxies. So <coughs> to conclude, um, so 
it's important to have properly estimated aerobus for, for VAO. Um, we want to measure cosmological distances in a way that is independent of cosmological background model, of the cosmological background model. We identify two ways to do this. The first one we call correlation function model fitting, when we found a way to propagate all the errors. And so, and we, we found that the, um, the errors of the, of the standard VAO, they may, be re un they may be underestimated by nearly a factor of two. So then there are still questions, which model should we use? Um, how many parameters should we employ? Can be then reduced somehow? somehow. On which range of scales should we fit? Uh, so, and then we propose another approach. This we call the near point standard ruler. And uh, it's model independent, meaning that we don't need to know the correlation function model. And give us up to 50% more precise error bus with respect to the correlation function model fitting. Um, so then we should keep in mind to answer the, the first question of the, of the title that VL distances are not good for all the possible cosmological models, in particular for non-standard cosmologies, they, they may, have, may have not been tested. So for instance, if you have modified gravity, this can give up a, <coughs> a preferred scaling again that can, that can somehow spoil the, the standard VAO uh, feature at some level. Uh, so best fit and errors, they, they, may, they may be wrong. <coughs> um, so there is a lot to do. Uh, we want to break the genesis among the A and, and H. And to do this, we want to include uh, the quadruple information. So then what happens if you have massive neutrinos? Can we use the VAO or the linear point to constrain neutrino mass? And can also measure deviations from <coughs> a lambda CDM growth rate from the BAO. Um, can we work in angular redshift instead of working for moving coordinate? What are the light cone effect? Are the linear point properties stable? So then what happens if you have different galaxy populations, clusters, squares, one centimeter, and, and so on? Thank you. Okay, we have time for some questions. So I get that the linear point you define somehow, I get that the linear point you define somehow, you know, is not biased and get better results. But I was wondering if there is a physical meaning also behind this value because you just average between the maximum and the minimum and put yeah, it yeah. as some kind of a for now, For now, we don't know. Maybe, maybe. We tried a little bit. But what, what we have that is the feature that we can use and is stable so that for cosmology. So it will be nice to understand better why if there's a mathematical coincidence in lambda CDM and similar models, or if there is something deeper, that's, uh, that's an interesting question. But so when you showed your plot for the low C from the BOSS sample, uh, yeah. BOSS data, yeah, how did you really determine which is the dip and the peak here? Because it's noisy, right? So ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I couldn't give you all the details. Uh, it's, it's, uh, here, what we use is a model independent parametric fit. So we use the simplest that we, we could think about, that is a polynomial, and we validate this with the boss mocks. But then you can use Gaussian processes, whatever is uh, model independent, maybe we can get better results. So that, uh, yeah. Okay, if there's no further questions, let's thank all the speakers again. We should come back at 11 o'clock. <laughs> I was just playing. I mean, I'm expecting some aggressive. <laughs> you didn't tell me. Didn't didn't? <laughs> no. This thing we discussed, right? There's the uh, physical meaning of the linear point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, that, uh, that, but maybe it's a mathematical coincidence. That's really uh, so far what we. The uh, microphone back. Ah, sorry. <laughs> it's not the first time this happened to me. <laughs> Everything you say will be good. <laughs> Forever. Have you, have you thought of trying this in the Lemon Alpha Forest? Yeah, but that, I mean, I am not expert enough. <laughs> but in terms of the modeling, right, it's interesting because there's another non-linear It's another model, right? yeah. So far it's for plus. It's not clear for uh, maybe. I'd be curious.